On 15 August 2015, the Russian government approved a new state policy concept for perpetuating the memory of the victims of political repressions. It is stated in the concept that Russia cannot fully become a state governed by the rule of law and take a leading place in the world community without having perpetuated the memory of the many millions of its citizens who fell victim to political repressions. Two years later, on 30 October 2017, the monument to the victims of political repressions was unveiled in Moscow. Vladimir Putin took part in the ceremony. Calling political repressions the tragedy for our entire people, he stated that there can be no justification for these crimes. The approval of the state policy concept, the construction of the monument in the center of the Russian capital, and the words of the president all seem to suggest that Russia's ruling elite is finally turning to the painful process of coming to terms with their country's difficult past. But is it in fact so? How do we account for the ambiguities and contradictions in the Kremlin's dealing with the memory of repressions which, alongside the initiative to create a database of their victims, involves the hounding of the Memorial Society, which has been putting together such a database since 1998. Furthermore, how do we explain combining their decisions to upgrade the premises of the State Museum of the History of the Gulag and to establish a museum at the Memorial Complex Butova Firing Ground with an attack on Perm 36, a unique museum of the history of political repressions? In other words, does an official strategy towards memory of repressions exist? If so, what does it consist in? To put it bluntly, is Russia under Putin de- or re-Stalinizing? I suggest that the study of the Russia My History chain of multimedia historical parks may bring us closer to answering these questions. The parks sprung up throughout Russia in 2017-2019. Initially, the project of the Russian Orthodox Church, Russia My History, received overwhelming financial and administrative support from the state. It has become an instrument through which a historical narrative politically beneficial for Russia's ruling elite is reproduced. Nested within this narrative and tailored to fit it is a specific interpretation of the Soviet atrocities. In my paper, I reconstruct this interpretation as it is reproduced in the Moscow located headquarters of the Russia My History chain. Opened on 29 December 2015, it was the first park of the chain. At the time, it included three exhibitions of the cycle Orthodox Rus My History, the Rurikids, the Romanovs, and the 20th century from great upheavals to great victory. In 2018, the park underwent significant reconstruction. Not only was it complemented with a second part of the exhibition, the 20th century, dedicated to the period from 1945 to 2016. The exhibitions that had been on display in the park th since 2015 were modified. Most importantly, the halls of the park dedicated to the Soviet atrocities were changed considerably. In my paper, I analyze these changes, comparing the original and the revamped versions of the park's exhibitions. The original exhibitions of the Moscow Russia My History Park were composed of a set of halls, each one dedicated to a specific historical period. Flowing one into another, these halls left the visitor little freedom in choosing her way through Russia's history. Progressing through the park exhibitions, the visitor followed the path laid out by its creators. The exhibitions of the park displayed no artifacts. Instead, multimedia devices, some of them interactive, filled the halls. Visitors were expected to read the text projected on panels, screens, and light boxes, learning about the Russian history as it was narrated there. Color, light, and sound effects, as well as the spatial layout of the exhibitions, played a crucial role in the forging of the park's specific historical narrative. The first thing a visitor saw when entering the 20th century from Great Upheavals to Great Victory exhibition was the history timeline. On it, various historical events were t listed in chronological order. Interactive screens displaying the same timeline were located in the halls. An inscription on the wall became a link on the screen. Clicking on it, a visitor was redirected to an entry with usually very brief information about the corresponding event. The timeline represented the history of the Soviet Union as a collection of policy decisions, economic achievements, military battles, and international agreements. 
when accounting for the events related to the atrocities of the Soviet era, the timeline demonstrated a specific approach. It consisted in focusing on administrative actions rather than on their victims or perpetrators, disregarding the causes of events as well as their effects, and emphasizing the pragmatic aspects of policy decisions at the expect of the ethical ones. Stretch, stretching throughout the halls of the exhibition, the history timeline constituted nothing more than a chronology of isolated historical events. When reading it, it seemed even the most attentive visitor would be unable to trace the connections between the disparate facts, to link causes with effects, to identify processes behind the mosaic of dates, names, and numbers. This is probably why the authors of the exhibition employed different devices to highlight the topics they considered crucial in the history of the Soviet Union. In addition to the history timeline, each exhibition hall had several large panels, up to six meters high and four meters long each. They were dedicated to specific topics. An interactive screen was positioned in front of each panel. Inscriptions on panels were replicated as links on the screens which a visitor could click on and be redirected to an entry with more detailed information on the corresponding topic. Several of the exhibition halls had other types of devices, light boxes, kiosks, installations. Tellingly, none of these de various devices were dedicated to the, to the atrocities of the era. In eight out of 10 exhibition halls of the 20th century from great upheavals to great victory, the account of the Soviet atrocities remained concealed in the history timeline. But what about the remaining two halls? It was in these two halls, number four, the new marches and confessors of Russia, and number eight, the repressions, that the tale of the Soviet atrocities was narrated in a somewhat consistent way. Both halls were similarly designed, low lit, and seeming even more somber than the other, also quite dim halls of the exhibition. They were colored a disturbing blood red. In addition, the two halls were un united and at the same time differentiated from the remaining halls of the exhibition by audio effects. In them, visitors were haunted by abrupt sounds reminiscent at once of a military march, the hissing of a scourge, and the screeching of a saw. Each emotionally distressing, the two halls, however, differed greatly in size and, most importantly, in the position they occupied in the general layout of the exhibition. Considerably smaller than the others, the Repressions Hall was adjacent to the large hall titled Before the War. The entrance to the former was barely visible between the eye-catching panels, light boxes, and installations located in the latter. Tellingly, the Repressions was the only hall that a visitor could miss out when passing through the 20th century from great upheavals to great victory. Within the exhibition, whose halls taken together resembled a palace and violate, the Repressions seemed more like a closet. In the hall, the Soviet atrocities appeared as an isolated, though rough, side of life in the early Soviet Union, not as an integral feature permitting all aspects of it. Visitors' attention was drawn towards Soviet industrial successes, which were represented as having counterbalanced or even outbalanced these atrocities. The latter turned into a minor detail on the vast canvas of the Soviet triumphant advance were depicted as nothing more than the frightening seamy side of the Soviet paradise. In stark contrast to the Repressions Hall, the one titled New Marches and Confessors of Russia was positioned to attract visitors' attention. As part of the exhibition and violate, it was impossible to avoid. Divided into three zones, the layout of the hall was quite specific, reminiscent of a narrow labyrinth with the walls closing in on the visitor. Although the hall was relatively uninformative, it left a very strong and particularly emotional impression. Of crucial importance for creating this impression were the several light boxes located in the hall that were dedicated to those who had suffered for their faith and later been beatified. In addition, videos were projected on three screens located in the hall. Composed of fragments of newsreel, they showed crosses being thrown down from church domes, icons being chopped up with axes, campanas being broken into pieces. These images were edited to intermix with footage taken in the Gulag camps, representing the Gulag as the place of imprisonment of faithful Orthodox Christians. These videos turned the Soviet terror into outrages committed upon the Orthodox Church. 
the devices that were located in the hall, the videos that were shown there, the hall's distressing design, and most importantly, its size, shape, and positioning within the exhibition, all suggested that the tragedy of the Russian church was the key tragedy of the 20th century Russia. The spatial layout of the exhibition served to separate the victims of Soviet atrocities into two groups, Orthodox clergy and laymen on the one hand, and all the rest on the other. At the same time, the former were united with the latter by a specific historical narrative in which they were all cast as protagonists. To reconstruct this narrative, it is necessary to pay special attention to hall number five of the exhibition. Titled Panorama the People, this was a fairly large circular hall located between the new marches and confessors of Russia and industrialization and collectivization halls. Panorama the People was colored calm blue with soft and relaxing music inside. Instead of numerous interactive devices, the hall had a few cushions inviting visitors to sit and rest before moving on to see the rest of the exhibition. After exiting the distressing new marches and confessors of Russia, it felt almost a relief to enter the panorama. With its position within the exhibition, Panorama the People placed a full stop in the tale of the 1917 revolutions narrated in the historical park. These were portrayed as a tragic mistake or even a sin committed by the people of Russia, its consequences being decay, chaos, expulsion, tears, violence, blood, and death. At the same time, the whole opened a new chapter in history, that of Joseph Stalin's years. They appeared as the years of restoration, albeit at enormous cost, of what had been destroyed during the suicidal collapse of the state brought about by the revolutions. The whole thus symbolized a turning point in Soviet history, which, as it was narrated in the exhibition, unfolded like a pendulum from the period of reckless devastation that followed 1917 and was associated with Vladimir Lenin towards the Stalin era of painful revival, which was epitomized by the triumphant victory of 1945. The time in between replete with atrocities, these appeared as the cost of the former and the price that had to be paid for the latter. Thus, the suffering and deaths of their victims were invested with sense. The spatial layout of the exhibition conveyed, albeit tacitly, the idea that the decolonization, the organized famine, the forcible deportations, the gulag, and the great terror were all worthwhile. Their victims, a visitor could infer, did not suffer and die in vain. A similar idea was expressed more explicitly with regards to the persecution of the Russian church. The concept of new martyrdom was employed in the exhibition to interpret it and the ordeals of those who fell victim to it. They were not portrayed as victims, objects of ill, we, we, Ill will of either mad or villainous Soviet leaders. They were represented as agents sacrificing their lives for a higher purpose. However, theirs was a sacrifice made not for the love of God, but for the sake of the fatherland. They themselves were portrayed as patriotic martyrs. What, if anything, changed in 2018 when the exhibition, along with the Moscow Russia My History Park, underwent significant reconstruction. The new marches and confessors of Russia Hall, now titled The Persecution of Religion, has become somewhat smaller. The Repressions Hall, now called the Great Terror, has been relocated to include it in the exhibition and filet. In addition, the Panorama of the People has, Hall has disappeared altogether. The persecution of religions and the Great Terror Halls have been rendered less emotionally disturbing. The half-light, blood-red coloring, and shrill sounds are no longer employed to impress or distress visitors. At the same time, both halls have become more informative. In the Persecution of Religions Hall, several interactive devices are now located that relate the outrages committed against Orthodox Christians, but also Muslims, Jews, Protestants, and Catholics. In the Great Terror Hall, the history of the Soviet atrocities from the Red Terror to the post-war mass depressions is traced in detail. All in all, the issue of the Soviet atrocities now occupies a more prominent place in the historical narrative reproduced in the park. Moreover, the account of them has become more coherent and complete. With all of these changes, has the interpretation of the Soviet atrocities been affected?
In the original park, space was used ingeniously to disassociate the outrages committed against the clergy and laymen of the Russian church from those that targeted all other Soviet citizens. In its revamped version, space still separates the whole dedicated to the persecution of religions from the one portraying other Soviet crimes. However, the two halls now hold identical position in the park's spatial layout. This layout, it seems, is no longer employed to prioritize some victims of the Soviet atrocities over the others. On the contrary, the believers, be they Orthodox Christians, Muslims, Jews, Protestants, or Catholics, are now explicitly united in the park with those who perished in the Dekis accusation, the Dekul accusation, the Great Terror, the Gulag, the forcible deportations, and the organized famine. They are modeled against the new martyrs and confessors of Russia, much like in the park's original version, the new martyrs and confessors of Russia were modeled against the heroes of the Great Patriotic War. Thus, they are all portrayed here as having been harmed for a cause, their lives appearing not lost, but sacrificed for their fatherland. They themselves emerge as martyrs of patriotism. Just as in the original Moscow Russia My History Park, the tale of the Soviet atrocities in its revamped version is nested within a narrative of devastation and revival. Taken together, the former, caused by the 1917 revolutions, and the latter, manifested in the victory in the Great Patriotic War, constitute just one swing of the pendulum of Russian history. As narrated in the historical parks, it follows a cyclical pattern, oscillating back and forth from the blight and degeneration of the various times of troubles to the flourishing and grandeur of the eras of stability. In the park, the victims of the Soviet atrocities are cast as protagonists in this profoundly sadist narrative. They are portrayed as martyrs who sacrifice their lives for their fatherland. Their suffering and deaths are thus invested with patriotic sense. At the same time, their fatherland itself is celebrated here as worthy of suffering and dying for. Importantly, the fatherland stands here neither for the nation, nor for the land, but for the consolidated state with strong executive power, be it the Russian Federation, the Russian Empire, or the Soviet Union. Thus, the memory of the Soviet atrocities is turned from a potentially damaging commentary on Vladimir Putin's regime as it questions the value of a state capable of committing heinous crimes against its own citizens into a politically useful one, since it valorizes the very idea of a state, regardless of its ability to secure its citizens' well-being or their very lives. The analysis of Russia My History suggests that there is indeed a strategy behind the ambiguities and contradictions of the Kremlin's specific way of dealing with Russia's difficult past. This strategy implies neither working through it nor repressing the memory of it, neither re- nor de-Stalinization. Rather, it consists in turning it into a powerful tool of ingenious political manipulation. As Russia My History testifies, Russia's ruling elites will continue to abuse the country's past for political purposes. Moreover, the repertoire of this politically abused past will be broadened to include the Soviet atrocities. The project is also evidence to the fact that the Kremlin will no longer be leaving the memory of the Soviet atrocities and the commemoration of its victims to civil society. Rather, it will be attempting to take it over in order to put it to political abuse. All in all, the interpretation of the Soviet atrocities reproduced through the, through the chain of Russia My History historical parks demonstrates that the Kremlin has found its own special path through the country's difficult past implying neither remorseful remembering nor unapologetic forgetting, this path leads towards a point where the tragedies can be rendered politically useful.